Welcome. We are honored to have you listen and participate in these dialogues produced by the Cora de Brotza Foundation. To learn more about the Foundation and about how you can help us in our mission of unearthing untold stories of moral energy, visit virtuesofpeace.com. There, you can access our show archives, show resources, visit our Etsy shop, and support us with a donation, virtuesofpeace.com. Hello and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May and I'm joined by Michael Buzzy and Randy Olson. And we are here on May 18th, 2021, which is Peace Day, the original Peace Day. It's an important day because it's also the anniversary, the one year anniversary of this show. We began this podcast on May 18th, 2020. And as we said back then, May 18th is also an important day in Korea. It's the day of the Gwangju Democratic Uprising. If you don't know about that, there's an excellent film, Taxi Driver. Check it out. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> and so Peace Day well, began being celebrated in 1901, so 120 years ago, because May 18th was the day on which the 1899 Hague Peace Conference opened. And if you've listened to the show, you know that, that pre-World War I history the peace through law movement is really, really important for this show. Um, so today uh, I'm really, really excited to talk about two individuals that you probably have never heard of. Um, Olive Schreiner, uh, who was born in 1855 and died in 1920, and Howard Thurman, who was born in 1899 and died in 1981. Um, Thurman encountered Schreiner after she had died, and we'll talk about that encounter. And I, I see this as just such an important story, untold story of the peace through law movement. Um, it's if you don't know who Howard Thurman is, hopefully you'll you'll begin to learn about him. Of course, there are resources on our show resources page. And we will be playing a few audio clips, but I just want to mention now that one of the resources there is a link to some archives at Boston University, um, audio archives, and you can listen to Howard Thurman. We'll be playing from some of those clips today. So we'll, we will be talking about this encounter between Howard Thurman and Olive Schreiner and just to put it out there now, this is where we're gonna go. Um, as you will learn, the <clears throat> uh, nonviolent wing of the civil rights movement, so which we associate with Martin Luther King most of all, um, was really inspired by Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman has been referred to as providing the philosophical framework for the civil rights movement, or the spiritual foundation for the civil rights movement, and that is the nonviolent aspect of the civil rights movement. Um, Thurman distinguishes between nonviolence as a tactic and nonviolence as a way of life. You'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but it is my contention in, in this show to, to argue that this idea of nonviolence as a way of life, and we're going to be talking about what does that mean to live nonviolence as a way of life. That's the sort of substantive philosophical conversation that we will be having. But I really do believe that this, this idea of practicing nonviolence as a way of life comes from and can be traced to Olive Schreiner. And so hence, Olive Schreiner is there um, influencing the nonviolent wing of the civil rights movement through Thurman, through Martin Luther King, through Jim Lawson and all of the others. So um, if you don't know who Howard Thurman is, Google and you will learn um, a, a, uh, his chronology. We're not gonna talk about his entire chronology. I did mention he's born in 1899, he dies in 1981. And I wanna begin his chronology 
um, in 1925. So he's in his mid 20s and he's studying theology. He's getting a divinity degree at Rochester Theological Seminary. Um, it is at that time that he encounters Schreiner. So very early on, 1925. And what happens after this encounter? Um, Thurman, I, and this is why I, I've sort of led to him, was the first African-American to visit with Gandhi in 1936. Um, he was part of and headed an African-American delegation sent by the YMCA to India and some, some other places in Asia. Um, and as part of that trip, he did meet with Gandhi and that was in 1936. In 1944, he does this other incredible thing. And that is he builds with a philosophy professor named Alfred Fisk, something called the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples, which was an intentionally interracial church. One of Thurman's critiques of Christianity was that it did nothing about segregation, that um, the Christian, like the church just sort of like sat on the sidelines during Jim, the Jim Crow era and didn't do anything to address racial segregation. Uh, he points out that the church, the church itself is segregated. There's a white church, there's a black church, there's a Japanese church, there's a Korean church. And so it's not his idea to create this church. It's Alfred Fisk, a philosophy professor, but also I think uh, Alfred Fisk was ordained. He was also a pacifist, um, decides to create this thing. And Thurman, it's, that's, that's, a, that's a show in itself how that happens. <laughs> um, so Thurman goes to San Francisco and this church still exists, the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. Um, and he builds that church and he leaves in 1953 to go to Boston University where he is the, the, the dean of the chapel there. And that is at the time when Martin Luther King is there. And so Martin Luther King would go to Howard Thurman's sermons. They knew each other, they would hang out with each other. Um, so he's at Boston University until 1965. And then he leaves to establish the Thurman Educational Trust. In 1973, so while he's doing his Thurman Educational Trust, um, and I think at that time, he's sort of like organizing all of his archives, his papers, et cetera. He publishes an anthology of Olive Schreiner called A Track to the Water's Edge. Um, so this is 1973. So if you look at that span from 1925, when he first hears of Schreiner to 1973, he's publishing this book. And if you, you look at um, the audio archives, you will see he's talking about Schreiner throughout his whole life. Um, and so this, she, she had some um, profound impact on him. And that's what this show is about. So what's, what's going on there? And the way that I found Thurman, because I, I had not heard about Thurman a year ago today um, when we first started doing this show. Um, I, I'm very interested in John Lewis, uh, who died in 2020, and just doing re more research on where he came from. How did John Lewis become John Lewis? Um, John Lewis was a student of Jim Lawson. I'm going to throw that name out there. And Jim Lawson um, was very impacted by Howard Thurman. In a book called The Children by David Halberstram, um, Thurman is discussed and Thurman is mentioned as the first African-American who met with Gandhi. And I had like, it was reading that book and I was said, who is this person? I subsequently then read um, a book solely devoted to his, his pilgrimage to India meeting Gandhi. And in that book, it does mention the impact of Olive Schreiner on, on Howard Thurman. Um, <clears throat> so it was really trying to understand where, where does this nonviolent thread of the civil rights movement comes from, coming from. And it's, you know, Gandhi is always the one pointed to, but I think behind that uh, is Olive Schreiner. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, 
How does Thurman encounter Schreiner? Thurman is at a conference, um, a youth conference, and he talks about this in the anthology of his Schreiner anthology. He talks about the, the, the exact moment when he first heard Olive Schreiner's allegory called The Hunter. It was read aloud by another pacifist named George Collins. Um, he went by the nickname Shorty, which was a joke because he was six feet four inches. So George Collins reads Olive Schreiner to, I um, mean, you have to imagine a conference and Howard Thurman is sitting there and Howard Thurman says he's just blown away by this. Um, the Hunter is really about truth. It's an allegory about truth. And Howard Thurman says that moment sets him on a quest to read everything he can by Schreiner, which he does. Um, and then again, uh, to remind you, he publishes this anthology, you know, almost 50 years later in 1973. Um, so Schreiner is very much with him throughout his whole life and journey from 1925 and, until, he, until he passes. Um, so I'm just going to stop talking and, and see if anybody has you know, any, anything to add, any questions, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in and, and just do the same thing I always do, which is try to provide a, a frame in the simplest way that I can. You know, uh, this show is something that I've really come to appreciate as a way to connect dots in the historical narrative, you know, coming up into the present. And it's been really helpful for me. Uh, an understanding like why I care about some of the things that I care about. And so the frame I want to put together is within that vein. It's, it's this, this idea that, you know, the, the civil rights movement comes from somewhere. And when we trace it back, it's the, there's no like clear single point, but there's these, there's this web of influence that merges in with the peace through law movement and the women's suffrage movement, which if you follow it back, it, you know, it continues to connect with things. And, you know, this today being peace day, you know, peace day originally was something that was celebrated as a way to teach people about basically the same stories. The, the way that the dots connect across the world and building this, this big structure. And yeah, there was more of a concentration, you know, in the actual, in the school systems, like emphasis on Peace Day was supposed to be about the Hague and 1899 Hague Peace Conference and all of that. But the, the, the spirit of it remains true as far as I'm concerned with what we're doing here today. So um, I, I know that I'm, I'm really interested to, to talk more once we get the clip started so that we can all ground ourselves in what uh, Thurman actually says, mm -hmm. because it's so clear, but, you know, just, just painting that picture of like what I think we're doing was my intention. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. And Michael? then I will even, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Even as we begin to dwell into this and really getting into Shriner's piece as a whole, it really, the civil rights movement and Peace Day and The Hague and all of these large abstractions, movements, institutions that may seem very daunting and broad at first, that all of this stuff resonates on a very personal, very individualistic mm -hmm. level, which is where I personally think it has its most meaning. It has this ability in connecting these dots and coming to spin this narrative web and coming to know and embed these stories within yourselves. They truly will shape you as an individual and having that personal connection to these stories through coming, doing the process of unearthing them is very profound. And so to get into Shriner's piece and everything else, that this power on a very individual level, if you're able to go forth with this information and have it actualize itself in your own life, mm -hmm. whether it be nonviolence as a way of life or otherwise, that it has it's very profound and very powerful. Mm -hmm. So you no, know, I'm looking forward to the conversation to come. Yeah, and that that idea that you're talking about, this sort of personal impact, the impact on quote 
Thurman uses the phrase, one's private life. It's absolutely essential um, for any kind of upward social change. Uh, we'll get to that, but I just I just want to flag it. So it's it's uh, fortuitous. It's you know, <laughs> it's good that it has that effect because that that thing has this power to uh, affect the the society uh, in a positive direction. So we will begin actually with with a clip, um, and this is actually what you're going to hear is two clips spliced together. The first one comes from 2019 from a documentary on Howard Thurman called Backs Against the Wall. And you're going to hear this, this phrase, nonviolence as a way of life um, uh, and Martin Luther King's implementation of that. And then right after that, you're going to hear Howard Thurman speaking. Um, the clip that you will hear right after that is from 1959. And it is from a, a series, an audio series titled Jesus and the Disinherited. And I mention that because that's probably, that, that's, that's a title of a book that he publishes in 1949. And that's probably his most famous book, Jesus and the Disinherited. And he really does lay out in that book, um, nonviolence as a way of life. So let me prepare to play the clip. It is about three or four minutes long. Here it comes. Dr. King was not completely committed to nonviolence. When I say not committed, he saw it first as a tactic until he was fully converted to it as a lifestyle. And, and my father helped me with that to, to understand that early on, people saw things as a tactic. This is the best way. Dr. King then moves to this is a lifestyle. And that is a direct connection to Thurman's conversion. And here is a nonviolent revolutionary. When I use nonviolence as a technique, and there is a difference perhaps between using it as a, as a social technique and using it as a private way of life. And let us, let us not be deceived by this. I have known and I have been involved in one way or another myself, I suppose, at times. I've known men and women who subscribed and who worked very hard on behalf of the use of nonviolence as a technique of love in the world but who themselves were very violent human beings in terms of how they related at the level of the individual. I think this is one of the reasons why it is so difficult for the various groups that work for peace ever to get together, you know. They, there's more war among the people who are trying to get a warless world and, than, than you can imagine. And this is, this is the reason. There is a subtle distinction, you see. And what, 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 what I'm pleading for is that, that what becomes the technique that I use to invade the external world seeking always to bring about in other individuals the operation of the same dimension of spiritual significance that is operating in me. When I, when I do this, I must bear in mind that, that the technique that I use in order to bring about social change must not be other than the technique that I use in my private, personal, intimate relations. Right, so again, that's Howard Thurman speaking in 1959. Uh, part of his Jesus and the Disinherited series. You can listen to the entire clip if you go to our show resources page and click on the project at Boston University and, and find the clip that way. Uh, such, such an amazing, yeah, so amazing to hear his voice um, and the, the way that he delivers um, the, this wisdom. And so I, I just want to take a moment to to talk about this claim that um, there's a difference between nonviolence as a tactic 
and nonviolence as a way of life or a lifestyle. And as he points out in this clip that um, if there's not a, like peace activists, if there's not a war, they're sort of like fighting amongst themselves <laughs> and, they're, and they're violent to each other. And this is not going to do anything um, that you have to use the same approach, nonviolent approach in your personal life in the wider world. So I'll just, yeah, go I, ahead. I, I mean, I, I, I love that. I feel like, I feel like it drills down to the level of beauty that like a uh, mathematical theories generate where it's like, it's so simple that it must, it must be right. I, mm -hmm. Like uh, for me, the the connection is to the the idea of ahimsa which is like a it's an eastern mysticism word right and it means nonviolence or non-harming and it's like the core principle of basically every system that's related to india right so the hindu tradition buddhism jainism yoga right nonviolence is the core principle and and any any book written about any of those spiritual traditions worth its worth its weight has a way of tying all other things back to nonviolence in some fundamental way and you know it gets complicated because it's always couched in language about karma right so it starts to get really messy but i love that i love that it gets uh, Thurman just really drills right to the point where it's like, you know, if you're at war with yourself or if you're at war with the people who you're trying to build a peaceful world with, it's not going to make a peaceful world. <laughs> he, said it, he, did, he said it differently, but um, I, I can say more, but uh, before I before I go too far, I know I'm sure Michael has things to add too, so I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> I'll yeah. pause. Yeah, I'll jump in as well, Brandy. I really love what you had to say. And yeah, it's what Thurman says. I, to I totally love it as well. And it's just so, like you had said, it's so simple that it just must be true. And you can even think if societies, when they deal with each other, they use violence as a tactic or they use war, coercion, manipulation as a tactic to some supposed end that they view as in the best interest of themselves. Those are going to be tactics as you learn through doing them repeatedly, those are going to be tactics that you will then come and implement into those interpersonal relations that Thurman touches on in those private settings. And when in that way, you are also the way in which you harm other larger abstractions of individuals in society sense, you also perpetrate that same harm on the individual level when you come to implement those same tactics. And so, yes, as nonviolence is a tactic through repeatedly undergoing that process for yourself and implementing that in your strife for civil rights, implementing that into your interpersonal relations, that will yield different results in the connections you have with those around you in a more meaningful, heartfelt sense than if you were to do the former and only further only further perpetuate the, the maladies of society that you would be doing at a grand level than at the individual. And yeah, back to that individual connection. It's, it's really all pivots on that. And that's where it's true meaning and wellspring comes from. And I just think Thurman truly, truly captive captures that in his, in his clip. Yeah. And, and I'll add on to that if I may, um, in addition to like this connection to the religion, ahimsa and the religions of, of India, um, I like to, you know, also mention it's it's home in Aristotelian metaphysics, because Aristotle makes a like he distinguishes between potentiality and actuality, and the only way to make something that's potentially hot, actually hot, is to have an actual flame, <laughs> right? You 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 have to have the actuality to uh, unlock. The potentiality and you probably like it's a very famous quote that Martin Luther King says something like um, hate hate will only bring hate only love can drive out hate 
And so it's this, you have to have this presence of this other thing to change and to you know, actualize the potential for peace. So you have to have peace and where is that but in the person is something that we have stressed on this show repeatedly. It's, 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 it's not like, it's not out there, it's in a person. So a person has to bring it in themselves to then light the, the flame or if you will, or, or actualize the potential in the world. So- um, yeah, uh, one. Yeah. I just I can keep going with that. I mean, it's like, <laughs> and it, it's so cool because once you take away the external emphasis of the nonviolence idea, and you start to internalize it, you realize it's so much deeper and so much richer. And like, I'll I'll give an example, right? So, you know imagine a good person who's going to try to help someone they're trying to engage in an act of compassion now if they internally haven't done a tremendous amount of work they might find themselves worrying about the person who they've helped or the person they're about to help and it's it's un- it's only until the moment where you start to take nonviolence internally and really start to concentrate on it that you start to recognize worry as a form of violence because it's you know when you look at it all the way it's this lack of faith in the other person and so you're trying to help them and that means that you have something they don't and there's this violence in that and it's not the same thing it's like this distinction between helping versus supporting emerges out of the nonviolent adoption early on in the process. And if you don't adopt it at the beginning of the process, the tactic starts to fail. Mm -hmm. And it's so crazy. It's so crazy. Mm. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 like you said, um, unless they've done a lot of work, (laughs) I want to bracket that you said, you know, if you, if you're going to show compassion to someone, um, unless you've done a lot of work and like, let's, let's bracket that because now we've been talking in abstract terms about the nonviolent lifestyle question, like what exactly does that involve and what kind of practices do you have to engage in? And I think Olive Schreiner helps to clarify um, that. And so on our show resources, we have the very last thing that she wrote and um, it was published posthumously. So after she died, again, she dies in 1920. This was published a hundred years ago in 1921. The title of it is called The Dawn of Civilization. And the subtitle is Stray Thoughts on Peace and War, The Homely Personal Confession of a Believer in Human Unity. Just had to add that. This was supposed to be a book. Um, It's about three, three or four pages. Um, and so her husband published this after she died. He asked, she asked him to publish this and, and, and he does, and it finds its way to Thurman. And we're going to hear him reading from part of this. So that's the next clip I'm going to play, but I want to set up the clip. Um, the clip is also, um, it's, it's all from one clip, but I'm splicing two different moments in the clip. Um, at the very beginning of the clip, he mentions what is happening in Montgomery. And what he's referring to um, are the freedom rides, which we have spoken about on this show, um, I think, yeah, on September 2nd, 2020, we have a show on the freedom rides. Um, John Lewis was part of that. <clears throat> and the freedom rides, if you don't know, um, the, what John Lewis and, and other mainly students, many students were doing were peace, was peace through law. What they're trying to do is implement the decisions of the Supreme Court, which means implement the United States Constitution. Okay, so the Supreme Court, and I should, you know, yesterday was the anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education, sacred day, May 17th, 1954 the Supreme Court desegregates the public schools, okay? But was there still segregation? Yes. Um, Something called the Boynton decision 
the Supreme Court desegregates bus terminals. Was there still segregation? Yes. Were there segregation in lunch counters? Yes. So these act the freedom rides were really the nonviolent technique of implementing the actual law. So it's very much in the quote peace through law movement. This is connected with Supreme Court jurisprudence. And that's why these freedom rides were organized. They were organized by something called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And one of the founders of that was a student of Howard Thurman. Um, so there's all these linkages um, to Howard Thurman. And so again, he's gonna mention what is happening in Montgomery and what is happening in Montgomery are the freedom rides. They were supposed to stop. I think they began on May 4th, 1961. And they were supposed to stop on May 17th 1961 again because May 17th was the anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. They they strategically chose that day as we chose Peace Day to begin our show a year ago. Um, so that's he, he's that's going to be the first part of the clip. You're going to hear him talking about what's happening in Montgomery and let's take a moment and like meditate on this and then you're going to hear him reading. He doesn't say what he's reading. He does not say what he's reading, but what he is reading is Olive Schreiner, The Dawn of Civilization. And he's reading something that you will find on page 914. Again, you can access this on our show resources page, The Dawn of Civilization. He's going to read from that. And I think you know, what he reads definitely lays out what is it to practice nonviolence as a lifestyle. And then we're gonna talk about that. So again, about three to four minutes, here it comes. We are all aware, I'm sure, of the very tempestuous and fateful moment that is being lived through in Montgomery, Alabama today. I am suggesting that while the organist plays the prayer hymn through very quietly twice, may we each in his own way deal with what is involved for us all by thought, by meditation, and those who pray by prayer. You cannot, by willing it, alter the vast world outside of you. You cannot, perhaps, cut the lash from one whip. You cannot stop the march of even one armed man going out to kill. You cannot, perhaps, strike the handcuff from one chained hand. You cannot even remake your own soul that there shall be no tendency to evil in it. The great world rolls on and you cannot reshape it, but this one thing only you can do. In that one small, minute, almost infinitesimal spot in the universe where your will rules, Where alone you are as God, strive to make what you hunger for real. No man can prevent you there. In your own heart, strive to kill out all hate, all desire to see evil come even to those who've injured you or another. What is weaker than yourself, try to help whatever is in pain or unjustly treated and cries out, say, I'm here. I, little, weak, feeble, but I will do what I can for you. This is all you can do, but do it. It is not nothing. And then this feeling came to me, a feeling it is not easy to put into words, but it was like this. You also are a part of the great universe. What you strive for, something strives for, and nothing 
in this universe is quite alone. You are moving on towards something. Right, so that was from May 21st, 1961, Howard Thurman reading from Olive Schreiner's Dawn of Civilization, published in 1921. Um, and this is all happening during the Freedom Rides of 1961. So yeah, I believe there, I, I think that this is a really useful passage of Schreiner to help us begin to unpack um, what it what it means to live a quote nonviolent lifestyle, um, and I, I also want to again mention Thurman's book Jesus and the Disinherited as also laying out the blueprint uh, for for how to do that. And I just want to mention um, one of the things that Thurman is famous for is the so called Hounds of Hell. Um, which he talks about in Jesus and the Disinherited. And these are the sort of emotional, psychological demons that plague the oppressed. So fear, hate, and hypocrisy, um, that these must be dealt with in a proper manner. Um, so that's also part of this, quote, nonviolent lifestyle. But let's begin with this a clip by Olive Schreiner that, that he read. And I, I just want to fasten on <clears throat> this one sentence where he, reading from her, he says, in your own heart, strive to kill out all hate and all desire to see evil come even to those who have injured you or another. Um, now, Elsewhere in his sermons, he says things like, we have to cultivate our desires and we have to desire to desire to do this. We have to desire to desire to get rid of hate. And of course, forgiveness is part of that. This is, you know, this, <laughs> this is the, you know, very substantive part of the show, I think, where we try to yeah, do a deeper dive into what does it mean to do these things? What do you have to do to strive out all hate and cultivate your desire so that you do not hate and you do not desire to see evil come to those who have injured you or another? I'll stop talking and, and leave it open to anyone who wants to jump in. Well, I, I have a, a lot to say about this. Um, <laughs> The, the first thing is that, you know, small things done many times are big things. And one of the things that I, I learned from a woman named Annie Besant um, has to do with how the kinds of things that we don't believe ourselves to be capable of happen out of necessity because uh because of negligence and the so I'll, I'll connect these dots here um when you know when something's about to take place that is uh like an explosion of violence and hate there's one way to look at that which is you know a person should have stopped themselves in that moment from, you know, hitting the person or yelling at the person or whatever, doing this explicit demonstration of violence. But Besson explained really beautifully in uh, in a book called Ancient the Ancient Wisdom uh, that, like, the conditions for that moment had been set up long beforehand and created a necessity in that moment. And so, you know, tying these, like, uh, I'll unpack that with one example, right? So if you're in the shower, right? You're just sitting there, you're thinking about stuff. There is basically, there's basically zero resistance to you thinking peaceful thoughts about the people in your life and the people who, you know, you might be potentially encountering throughout the day. 
there's no there's no uh stimulus that's making hatred come alive in you and if in those moments you're sitting there brooding on memories and whatever else and creating this like soup of hate inside of yourself then when you actually go and encounter a person the hate explodes out of you in a deterministic way and so Besant explains like, well, the, the secret to free will and determinism, like the conclusion to that age old conversation is the fact that we create our own necessity through habitual thought. And so when we're talking about trying to create a lifestyle of nonviolence, it's not in the heat of the moment where the, the real work takes place. It's the consistency in the small quiet moments where there isn't anything else happening. Mm -hmm. Now it's weird because that kind of diligence is so much harder than it sounds. Mm -hmm. You know, how many, how many times, you know, are we in the middle of a thought and then just something else shows up, some other idea, some other thought. And it's, and it's one that sparks violent thoughts inside of us whatever those might be, whether they're worries, whether they're fears, whether they're outright violent thoughts about some person who potentially humiliated us or who knows what it is. Those thoughts need to be stopped in those moments all day long in order to really adopt a nonviolent frame of reference for, the, for your own life. And so it's that stuff, right? It's those little things all day long that pile up that uh that thurman is encouraging us to to do something about right it's this is all you can do but do it and like i love that line yeah that's I love that. that's schreiner <laughs> oh yeah 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 so he's quoting from her yeah, yeah. he said it so i that's yeah, yeah yeah so you know reading from jesus and the disinherited i have it open in front of me and this idea like you know, this is a built up practice. And he uses the phrase painstaking discipline. I'm going to read you the whole sentence where he says this. Um, Obviously, then, merely preaching love of one's enemies or exhortations, however high and holy, cannot, in the last analysis, accomplish this result. At the center of the attitude is a core of painstaking discipline. That's what you're talking about, Randy, that just like this this continuous effort, he goes on to say, made possible only by personal triumph. Um, and so whatever the nonviolent lifestyle includes, it includes painstaking discipline. <laughs> so that, as you're pointing out, this, this attitude of, of compassion and and Schreiner has something to say about how we do that. It's, it's not in this clip, it's in other clips, um, but we'll, we'll go on to talk about that in a moment. But, um, you know, it's, it's in these small details, as you said, and then if you practice them enough times, it becomes a habit. But um, in that Schreiner quote, she also says something like, I cannot, I can't change the world that, I'm born into. Like, I can't change the fact that there are evil people. I can do one thing. And that is, I can, you know, strive to strive to kill out all hate. And she, and she goes in, into this. Um, and she, somewhere in that passage, she says, look, I, I can't even control that. I, there's, there's not evil in me. I can like work on it. That's all I can do. And so that's all you can do through your entire life. So what's on the table now is like, there's this painstaking discipline of repeating this, whatever it is that you're doing in a moment of when, okay, so I, I stop having these, these bad thoughts in the shower <laughs> um, about someone who's, who's hurt me. Um, and I'm gonna add to that, I think this also involves um, like rewiring our approach to blame because you know blame is part of the thing that triggers 
you know, hate and, you know, this bad thinking about someone that this person hurt me. And so blame has to be worked on how, I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. Um, so Michael, you have, want to add to this? Oh goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much to unpack in Shriner's piece in the Thurman clip. And yes, most certainly to any listener, go to the show resources page at thinkwemust.com and read it for yourself. It does not take very long. And there it is just a whole immersion into what this nonviolent lifestyle and practice is. It's truly incredible. For me, when I had read it, the setup is Shriner interjects her own personal life into the piece and she discusses being very, very distraught with her existence and with the nature of humanity and the nature of the universe. And she mm -hmm. describes the scene where she's sitting in a valley before the sunrise and she's surrounded by these dew covered plants and she's setting, uh, she's setting at, sitting at the bank of this stream and she's just really in the throes of why do I exist? Humanity is horrible, all of this. And it truly, as both of you had mentioned on, she comes to recognize that she has no control over any of these external circumstances. And for me, that was instantaneous recognition of that Stoic, ancient Greek Stoic philosophy of a Stoic does not bemoan the circumstances over which they have no control. It is purely this individual internal world over which control over the self, that it is this internal work by which you have to do to cope within this existence where pain, hardship, and suffering are present facts of life. And how does one come to conceptualize their existence in a way where they can use those things as propellants towards achieving a higher consciousness instead of the, those being the facets of life that end up dragging you down. And so for in Shriner's reflection of all the hardship in the world, and she discusses how she's grown up in a land constantly torn by war, she's interacted with the individuals who have undergone this. And for me, that it's this spark, it's that pain, that mental anguish that serves for her as this coming to consciousness moment, as Carl Jung says, there's no coming to consciousness without pain. It is that process by which then she comes to this very stoic realization that it is the self that I have control over. It is this internal work. It is conceptualizing all of this hardships and the humanity that in the hard and the terrors of humanity that I come to encounter. It is that process by which I'm able to live and ascend above all of the pain and anguish that seems to so readily stimulate one's immediate focus and deter their conscious reflection from the internal self. So that was the one part and which was so profound that it also, and then continuing this theme of, it's very individualistic and to look out and as Randy was talking about in the shower and you reflect on the harms or your death by a thousand cuts that you've experienced, whether it's, you know, car battery, it's always, and as Hope you had touched on, it's this blame that, oh, it's the external. It is this individual who hates me. It is the car battery that will not seem to fire, or it is, you know, a horrible boss or the circumstances of the institution I find myself in. When it is really this, process, you're just constantly ejecting all and projecting all of this anguish out onto the mm -hmm. broader exterior. It's not internal. It's the blaming everything around you. But something very profound occurs when you're able to stop that mm -hmm. and turn all that energy and focus that one does on blaming everything on the external and turns it inward. And you begin to reflect on how these supposed things, whether car battery, individual institution, how these things seem to be afflicting me. What, how am I conceptualizing the world in which I live in that is allowing these things to bother me? How can I find ways in which to use these things to come to a higher state of consciousness, be a propellant towards working towards a better inner life where I'm able to navigate these inevitable facts of life of suffering, hardship, and pain in a way that is meaningful, in a way that is purely individualistic, that in, in which the inner world is able, to, is able to be more fulfilling and meaningful instead of constantly bogged down when where no attention is being 
put into the internal when all of it is being ejected on mm -hmm. to the outside. And I'll stop there. There's so much else, but no, that's, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, um, it's funny, uh, like the phrase blame shifting, I think it's used in connection with like narcissist behavior where, where a narcissist will never accept responsibility and a narcissist will say, well, you know, you're the one who, so it's not, it's, I didn't do something wrong. You did this. And so the narcissist will not see him or her or themselves as the at fault. But what you're talking about is like this blame shifting writ large <laughs> that, that um, like instead of focusing on the external as the source of my, my, my inner pain that I have to shift the blame from the external to the internal. And this is how I'm conceptualizing things and I have to work on how I'm framing things. And that does bring me to um, another allegory that Thurman does mention. We don't have a, this clip, but um, it's there. So if, if you want to know where it is, you know, find us at virtuesofpeace.com. I, I will say, Michael, you mentioned thinkwemust.com instead of virtuesofpeace.com, but um, yes, the, the article is on virtuesofpeace.com. Although thinkwemust.com has some great resources as well. <laughs> Um, but the Shriner article is on virtuesofpeace.com. So in another allegory, so what, what does this reframing look like? And um, so John Lewis, who to my knowledge doesn't mention Oliver Shriner at all, but does mention that when he's being trained for nonviolence as a tactic, that part of that technique is imagining the people who are hitting them, putting cigarettes out on their head, throwing water on them, to imagine those people as babies. And so you're reimagining the offender. And this definitely, um, Schreiner talks about, this is from, I think, yeah, it's from the allegory called In a Ruined Chapel. So if you want to track it that way, In a Ruined Chapel by Olive Schreiner, that um, Thurman definitely quotes from that in some of his sermons. And this is about forgiveness. And an, an angel comes down to a, like a wretched man who's just like really bitter and he will not forgive the people who have harmed him. And the angel like really tries to open his eyes and, and it like, it can't like he he this guy will not do it he's just forever you know in the shower brooding on those who have heard it hurt him and so finally like god helps the angel and what god does is allow the angel to give the wretched unforgiving man the ability to see his offender without all the accoutrements of you know the the social self that just is sort of like a naked being. Um, when we had our show on Hamsa Khan, you know, Si'al, just like stripped of all identities and social categories, race, gender, what have you, just like the human soul itself, all that it could have become, all of its failures, all, like all of this, just the, the human soul itself. And um, at that point, the wretched man goes, it is I myself, it is me. This, this is an Olive Schreiner, by the way. <laughs> okay. So this is Olive Schreiner again in a ruined chapel. Um, and so we like reimagining, um, I mean, maybe the car battery, I don't know, like, <laughs> like you can help us. Um, but like it's, if it's people who are the source of your, your angst and your enmity and your ill feeling and your hatred, that the nonviolent lifestyle involves repeatedly reframing that person um, in, in a way that takes away the sting. And uh, you know, I think it probably depends on the circumstances, but that's you know how that that actual work looks like. I think, and I just wanted to yeah mention this Schreiner allegory. Uh, where that that's discussed uh, i'll stop talking and leave it open yeah. to anyone I'll, I'll i'll pick up the thread um you know this idea this idea that the like i want to come back to something we were talking about where that's like the evil is inside of us <laughs> um mm -hmm. and it's like 
in recognizing like in ver with various different methods that the evil is something that's inside of us and i just want to point out that you know that's not a terrifically new idea but it doesn't make it any easier right so you know in you know in the in genesis you know even god couldn't keep the snakes out of the garden right so this is this uh it's a eternal problem that that things aren't as good as we wish they were mm -hmm. um and i just, I just want to since you're on that point um I just, I'm just going to read, it's, it's Olive Schreiner, the way that she says what you're saying is, you cannot remake your own soul so that there is no tendency to evil in it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and instead, I mean, if, if any of the, the spiritual traditions are, are, you know, have anything to suggest for us, it's that, well, the thing you have to do, first of all, is just to pay attention, right? Yeah, it's the first step. It's always the first step. And, and it's it's like it's harder than it sounds, and we need all all the help we can get with the process of paying attention to these things. And so, uh, as a shout out to what we did a year ago, um, we we were talking then about the Pro Concordia Labor Badge, and this is another example, as far as I'm concerned, of a of a tool of a of a way to m make this process of nonviolence part of uh, you know part of your habitual response to the environment and and to yourself and the idea of the badge very briefly is you know you wear this this symbol in the form of a pin on your body a physical item a physical token to remind you that you made a decision and the decision was in court to live in accordance with the golden rule to treat others in the same way that you would like to be treated and one of the obvious implications of that is going to be nonviolently. Like, I don't think anyone's explicitly saying, I wish to do violence towards myself, therefore I'm going to explicitly do violence towards others. The people who do that are, 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 are they're clearly the outlier. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll leave it at that. And, and you might even say that they're malfunctioning if you dare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, a, it's a, a mistake, right? It's a mistake to do that. Now, you know, it gets complicated when you, you know, are doing something in the, in the realm of like tough love or righteous indignation, right? That starts to get really complicated. But the, the badge and the idea that I'm presenting is, is just this. We need help with the process of paying attention to the evils that exist within ourselves. Because we do stuff all the time that we don't even notice. And the idea is... If you're wearing this badge, you've made a commitment to yourself that you want to live a life that's in accord with a certain set of principles. And if you notice yourself not doing that, you have to do something physical. You have to remove the pin as an, as an acknowledgement. And it's like the second you instantiate this level of morality into your physical body, it's not possible to not grow in awareness. It's weird because it's like, you know, you can set up such a simple micro routine and then it starts to unfold over time into these really large personality changing uh, habits. Now, that doesn't remove the fact that the snakes are in the garden, right? There's going to be a new snake. There's going to be inevitably a consequence of this that looks something like uh, spiritual pride, where you start to hold yourself up for being so moral about how you can be nonviolent and not other people don't. And then there's judgments and then there's blah, 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 blah. It keeps going. Right. But that doesn't mean you don't do it because it's clearly an upward trajectory. Right. And it's like, <laughs> you know, when things are getting better, keep doing them. <laughs> So I could go on, but I, I think I've made the point. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so, Michael? Yeah, I seriously, all it's all just so good. <laughs> and yes, virtuesofpeace.com, not thinkwemust.com. <laughs> Different initiative, but yeah, there's lots of good all stuff connected. there too. All yeah, connected. all connected. Yes, only connect, live in fragments no longer. Thanks. Totally. 
And so <laughs> another thing that had that we were touching on as well is the f- the framing of the wrongs and especially in terms of what individuals wound up doing too. And I was also once again drawn back to ancient Greek philosophy and f- to Socrates in particular when during his trial, as recorded in the Apology, what he says, I don't, I don't suppose it is ever possible for a good, a good man to ever be harmed by a worst. And that these supposed external harms are just your way, the way in which you frame it. And then that ref, the refraction of whatever you feel is being brought upon you from someone else back to them in forms of hatred or malice that you feel towards them for what they are supposedly doing to you. But if it's this recognition of in that stoic sense that that is a circumstance over which I have no control and it is through my process of coming to realize that it is my shift in the way in which I can go about it. And even that aspect of love that was touched on by in Shriner's piece, I thought was really profound as well, that she's describing the individuals who perpetrate harm to other animals and, and to other people and within her environment. And she describes having a, an immense desire to go up to them and just say, somebody loves you, that to really just go in for the guts and go right to the pet void, as, <laughs> as Hope May's concept would say, and really just grab hold and say, no, that it, it is this, it is that power of the love and acceptance of others. And that's nonviolence of that those who are perpetrating harm upon you, it is that this is a like you are as you had said hope like they're malfunctioning that this is i recognize that this is something that you're running on bad energy that you're running on this prejudice this hatred and that's okay i just want you to know that somebody loves you and if you're willing to consult your own inner world in a way where you'd be able to seek help from individuals who are also doing the same that that's going to be a powerful propellant and truly how the nonviolent tactic can also be very societal and individualistic and that it also helps to improve and greatly enhance those private relationships that you have in your own personal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I also want to add, since we're we're mentioning websites, um, when Randy was talking about the, um, the badge, the universal peace badge, yeah, you can, you can uh, obtain one at, um, our Etsy shop. So if you go to virtuesofpeace.com, there's a link that says shop and uh, that will take you to some uh, some peace badges, some other tools that, that we use that were created by Cora de Brutza, um, who created the peace flag, which was flown on the original peace day, which we are celebrating today. So painstaking discipline. Yeah, the snake is always in the garden um, and yeah, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's an interpretation of Dante's Inferno, but, um, at one point, yeah, Dante is interpreted as saying something like, don't get too comfortable in your, in yourself. Um, there's always a tremendous amount of work to be done. Um, and you haven't won. Like, 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 con- it's like confidence is almost like confidence in yourself is, is almost a mistake that you have so much work to do. And I think that, you know, when you really recognize that, and that's not, that's not a pleasant thing to recognize, um, you become a little bit more forgiving of other people. Um, so there's, there's a, there's a value right, that extends to other people. When I recognize how much work I have to do, well, that means if I have to do all this work, okay, I can surely understand someone else who probably doesn't have to do all the work that I have to do, this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to yeah, build ahead. on that real quick. Uh, I mean, because uh, that starts to flesh out the methodology associated with imagining the people doing violence towards you as babies. Mm. It's like if you're seeing them as a baby, you're seeing the potential for them to grow. It's not just that they're not really in a position to do enormous amounts of harm to you or that they're someone that, you know, you 
want to show affection towards and love. It's like it's the potential component. And it's like it's actually the most optimistic frame of reference possible, I think, hmm. is to, to, to recognize that you have more to learn and that they have more to learn. And that gives you this opportunity to be on the same team because you need each other. Mm-hmm. Like that, that frame of reference becomes possible through the methodology that's built into the like nonviolence as a tactic. That's like, mm-hmm. it's not just a tool. It's a tool that actually pulls everybody on the same team in such a, such a significant way. Mm. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't think we're going to, finish unpack it all today so maybe we'll come back in a week or two but like <clears throat> we, we've just been talking about like we're trying to lay out you know the the non-violent lifestyle and what does that look like so what we've said is it is a painstaking discipline where you're working on um your assessment of blame and shifting it from outside to inside and working on your concepts and how you look at people who are quote unquote harming you, who are themselves, you know, malfunctioning. Um, so, and this takes a lot of work because most of our lives we have been assessing blame on the outside. Um, and so this is, this is, doesn't happen, you know, overnight. Um, the other, the other thing that Olive Schreiner says, she says so many other things that that Thurman echoes. Um, And again, it's the subtitle of this, this piece that he quotes from, The Dawn of Civilization. The subtitle is The the Homely Personal Confession of a Believer in Human Unity. I also think that for both Schreiner and Thurman, that a foundation of the nonviolent lifestyle is a certain belief about unity and it's only connect live in fragments no longer it is everything is connected and this goes to what you're saying randy that like we need each other martin luther king is well known for saying something like we are all bound together in an inescapable network of mutuality i cannot be what i ought to be until you are what you ought to be this idea this idea that everything is unified that my growth is connected to your growth and quote we need each other Indeed. And so I just want to track that to like, there's this belief in human unity and you really have to come to believe that. (laughs) I mean, and that I think takes practice and reading and reconceptualizing things, right? It's, it's a, it's a philosophical attitude to, to, to say everything is connected. Um, So I'll just pause there. So yeah, the claim is that there is a kind of philosophical framework or metaphysical belief about the unity of all things that I think is, I'm going to say that it's necessary for the nonviolent lifestyle. But if you don't, if you don't really believe that, really believe that like in your bones, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible for you to have the, to live a nonviolent lifestyle. Well, and I think that it's worth I think it's worth diving into that even, you know, as far as we are, as well, as far as we're capable. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and for my, for my part, you know, as I have this, uh, I guess, habitual need to build frames for things, (laughs) I'm going to frame this in in another way. You know, if, if you have like trying to build anything, like, okay, I've been doing a lot of stuff with Legos and with children lately. And so it's like, (laughs) You know how impossible it is to build anything cool out of a single Lego? It's like, it's not how Legos work. And, you know, we exist in a world where the tiniest of particles are basically Legos. And it's like, we are just super, super complicated systems. But if we want to make really complicated systems, we have to work together. There's no way around it. I mean, I... I, uh, another simple idea it's like like i've tried hanging pictures before by myself <laughs> and you know hanging something with a second set of eyes it's so much easier a man strips in a level sorry <laughs> well 
<laughs> sorry, sorry. Listen, I, I'm all about command strips. That Velcro saves my saves saves me so much time. But the the idea of where it should go on the wall and d- determining whether mm-hmm. or not it needs to be symmetrical to this part or lined up with this part is something mm-hmm. that has to get felt out. And you get opinions on it and you make a decision about the aesthetic appeal based on a consensus. And that aesthetic appeal is not just a it's not a petty thing. It's like, it's like that's changing the entire environment. It's really, uh, it's going to impact the way the whole room feels. Well, so does everything that we do, right? And so if something simple and small like that is better with a multiple, with multiple interpretations of a couple different heads to take a, you know, and a couple, a couple different people to take a crack at that problem, then why would we imagine that things like the laws that govern behavior of large organizations or large groups of people would be anything less complicated. Well, we don't, right? Of course, these things require cooperation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah let, cool. me, let, me, let me pull it all the way together. There's a quote that I love from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago and you know talked about the horrors of the Soviet Union. And he says, the line... Uh, the line between good and evil is drawn straight through the human heart or something like that. It's like, it's like it, the cleavage between good and evil isn't out there. It's in here. And when you start to see that you start to take radical responsibility for your life, for your decisions, you start yeah. to see where you went wrong. And that it's like, you can't start to really help other people until you've done that. First of all, But once you've done that, it's not done. It's not like this burst of, oh, now I see the unity of all life. Now I see that it's my responsibility and we're done. It's like, no, 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 no. There's 5,000 layers above that where you have to struggle to see how everything is connected yet again at a higher frame of reference. And you start to zoom up and out and see more unity and how you can make that larger unity even more cohesive and even better. And you do that over and over and over and over and over. And after 50 years, you start to become the kind of person who can improve a community instead of just participate in it. Mm-hmm. And you can, that's how people become leaders of communities, right? Mm-hmm. It's like 17 year old Martin Luther King Jr. Not as effective as the, you know, mm-hmm. like, it's like, it's like he had to grow and develop and then he became who he was Mm -hmm. through the same process Mm -hmm. that we're all doing. And he had to be exposed to certain ideas. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Go ahead. ahead. No, you go. Well, I, I just, I want to, I want to smash the idea in that we, we have to do less harm to ourselves and the way that we do that involves carrying the largest burden that we can carry it's it's paradoxical like the more of our own moral failings that we're able to accept and take head on and try to improve the more peaceful our lives become which is so bizarre but it's the way that it works and I don't know, it's worked for me that way. And that's, that's, that's as true of a statement as I can generate. It rings true to me for whatever that's worth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that makes, that makes two then. Uh, two's better and, than one. And I, I, I just want to say also that this, since, since Michael has been talking about the Stoics and we do have some shows from 2011, maybe, where we're talking about um, the stoic view of unity. And exactly as you're talking about, Randy, that like we are built as parts of a whole. Like that's that's from Marcus Aurelius, if I recall. Like we're, that we're part of a system and it's a mistake to think that you are this isolated being. No, you are a part of a larger system. And I, I can't place it right now, but um, I, I will I will try to find it for, for next time. So I'm, I'm more prepared. But Olive Schreiner 
says somewhere, maybe it's in Dawn of Civilization, maybe maybe one of you can help me out here, but I, I, I can't place the exact place. She says something like, that's why I abhor violence so much because it bespeaks the discoordination of people. Like once you have violence, that's you know the smoking gun that the system is malfunctioning. And it's therefore, you know, painful for her to witness. So, and I, I just, I don't know, that 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 made a clearing for me that, okay, there's like, there's this discoordination that's going on and we have to work on having things work more harmoniously. So we're coming to the end and we'll, we'll just, I'll open it up in a minute, but I just want to just bracket where we are so that we know where to pick up next time. But all we've said, like this, this last bit is this thing about the unity of all things. And I think Randy, you're just like giving us like evidence for why that, that is true. Um, the claim here is that, that that belief, Thurman has it, Schreiner has it, and I do believe that that is like um, a necessary plank of the nonviolent lifestyle. Um, and that plank, and we'll go on to talk about maybe next time, implies other things. So once you've got that in place, these other things have to fall into place. And now I'll stop. Um. I mean, that's something we've talked about before, uh, where we, we we drew a connection with like it was it was a it was Bertha von Sutner saying doubts arose in me and I chased those doubts away. This idea that some kind of stimulus that's negative can point the way toward what you need to do, mm -hmm. and I think that from you know if we step back, we can say as you just did in different words, like when violence emerges it draws our attention to the thing that needs the most work immediately in the present. And we can respond to that without adding to it. And instead we can do this other thing. And what the, like the, the micro routines of what that looks like is different in every situation where violence emerges, but there's like, violence is the cue it's the mm -hmm. it's the the drum roll right before the moment where tremendous noble activity is about to take place ideally well right 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 that's, that's assuming that's assuming all the things we've been assuming today yeah. um and so again you know like the like since we did mention the freedom rides today and yesterday was the anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. Like that is like, that's the fact that there is the segregation and people are putting cigarettes out on people's heads. Like, yeah, that's the, you know, the drum roll uh, from, from whence you get, you know, John Lewis and, and Martin Luther King and, and Jim Lawson and all of that. That is exactly what happened at that moment. So that's what it looks like when it's working well. In our view, of course, there are crit critics of it that it didn't work. Conversation for another day. Michael, anything before we, we, we close out today's discussion? Yeah, and I agree. Definitely seeing those manifestations of the need for the recognition of greater connection. It's like you're sitting, I, I don't know, I envision the Chernobyl control room and you're seeing like all the lights flashing on all the panels of, you know, something's occurring and it needs immediate attention for sure. Yeah, and to also connect it to Bertha, just to sort of piggyback off of what Randy said and then lead us into the close of just this recognition of greater interconnectedness. I really, really love her concept of, she writes about it and the barbarization of the sky. It's the black cataract over mm -hmm. the mind's eye. And I mm -hmm. think that can take many, many different forms from your own ignorance, from your own projection of blame outward, from the own not consulting one's own prejudices and hatreds and so forth. And that, yeah, that black cataract sort of, when you view others through that lens, you see them, you see yourself in relation to other people as disjointed. You, the difference, the supposed differences are so much more brought into clear focus through that black cataract than when it is not there. When the black cataract is gone, when the consultations with ignorance and the dispelling one's own hatred and prejudices have gone away, you see the vast interconnectedness of 
individual at the end of the world as a whole. And so, yeah, that's further consulting of the inner life. That is further reflection in on oneself. And that is the process by which one, that is also another tool within the nonviolent tactic and then personal life as well, is that it's just this constant internal dialogue. They're also connected back to the ancient Greeks, to Socrates in particular, consulting with one's inner daemon, that inner voice, and where that particular influence is being fed from as well. Yeah, it's all so, so pertinent. And yeah, no, everything that's been touched on, all greatly interconnected from websites to the <laughs> nonviolent tactics for sure. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, and I think, you know, next time we'll continue to unpack this stuff. But um, yes, yeah, so um, know thyself, um, self knowledge, absolutely um, mentioned by Thurman. I'll try to get, find the clip where he, he mentions it. But uh, this is also part of the nonviolent lifestyle, this relentless, painstaking discipline of self-knowledge, which involves, as Randy said so eloquently, you know, realizing that the snake, there's going to be another snake in the garden. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I'll just, this is the one year anniversary of Virtues of Peace. And I just think, um, you know, we're, we're, we'll end the discussion of Thurman and Schreiner for now. But I would just like to, you know, have, have us reflect on um, what we've learned and, and um, sort of things that, if anything, sticks out and, and resonates. And I just want to say that um, I'll, I'll begin. And then, um, Randy, you'll have the last word. We'll go alphabetically, starting from Michael and then, and then Randy. But uh, I said it at uh, earlier in the show, um, again, I, I get it from, I, I got this insight from the David Halberstrom book, The Children, um, which goes into great detail um, about this nonviolence of the, of the civil rights movement. And I, I do not know as much as I would like to know about the civil rights movement. That's why I'm, I'm doing the show today. That's why I've continued doing my, my research on it. Um, and yeah, I knew there were freedom rides and, and there was segregation, but I did not, until I read the sentence in David Halberstrom's book, I did not grasp that they were implementing the US Constitution. That just, that just didn't occur to me. And I, I, just, I, I just think that's so important. Um, the, <clears throat> Today's Peace Day again, and Peace Day um, marks the beginning of the 1899 Hague Peace Conference. And a sort of, you know, the symbol of that is the Peace Palace in The Hague, bequeathed by Andrew Carnegie. And the Peace Palace opens up on August 28th, 1913. Exactly 50 years to the day, Martin Luther King gives his I have a dream speech, exactly 50 years. So August 28th, 1963 and August 28th, 1913. Those are really important. And um, I, I, I did like, I remember saying whatever, how many, eight years ago that, wow, because you know, you have 1913 and that's nonviolence at the international level and Martin Luther King and all of that is about nonviolence at the domestic level. Um, but I didn't really, in my head, make the connection between the implementation of law and doing that nonviolently. I did not then. I do now, thanks to David Halberstrom. And so, again, peace through law. Um, there's this thread that you can trace, as, as Randy said at the beginning. And, um, yeah, I, I would say, like, a year into this show, my appreciation of that has, has deepened and includes the civil rights movement and the women's movement that we've been talking about, such important linkages. Over to you, Michael. Important linkages indeed. <laughs> yes, as today marks the one year anniversary of the Virtues of Peace podcast and I jumped on board I do believe it was maybe two or three weeks after this one particular one. And mm -hmm. oh my, to say that, Everything that I have done associated with this show and with you, Randy, and with you, Hope and Taylor and all of our guests was life changing would be any or, you know, inner world changing would be an immense, immense understatement in that 
truly before this show, you know, Hague Peace Conference, maybe that was a floating notion that I had of something that occurred before the world wars. But in my own spheres of influence, it was something that was just wrote off as, oh, a minor blip in the historical context of larger humanity largely failed due to, you know, the inevitable world wars that ended up occurring. And so it was never something I took seriously or any of the birth of Von Sutner was an individual I did not know or any of these other tucked away aspects of positive history, which the goal of this show is to unearth and which makes it so profound. And that when all of what, for me personally, when all your major historical education is coming from is just like marked by war, violence, how world leaders and other individuals are going about manipulating each other to achieve their supposed ends, you're functioning off of bad energy. And I definitely think before this show, that was the energy and mindset I was functioning off of. And having an interest in international diplomacy and politics, it was most certainly brinkmanship and blowback and superiority over other nations through economic and trade schemes and all these other power grabs and stuff but no that is told all of that has truly been utterly annihilated in a way that it is something that I can look back on and learn from and recognize that that past way of understanding has truly evolved into something so much more meaningful so much more individualistic that everything I've come to pick up from every initiative we've done from this one, from today's show to the duty to remember, to our shows on Korea, to the ones talking about the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and everything in between, that all of these ideas continue to reverberate along the positive history vein and of peace history overall. And once you come to interact with those repeatedly, which it did take repeatedly, I will admit, <laughs> I was not sold the first, second or third time. But you know, by the fourth, fifth, it's like, okay, there's something, there's something going on here. And no, truly, it's been something that has utterly come to define my existence in personal aspects of my life. The lessons I've learned from here are ones I share with others. It's this repeated process by which you're constantly trying to actualize these ideals that you're coming into contact with, within the hopes that they will eventually just become nature. It has most certainly changed the way in which I view what I want to do for the world, what I want to do later on in life, the type of education I want to pursue, the relationships I want to have with my mentors and the individuals in my life and my peers. Truly, like it's shaped, <laughs> it's shaped every aspect of my being. And I also accredit a uh, background or, you know, having signed a major to philosophy in that as well. And granted, that's how I was able to come to no hope and Randy and everyone else. It was through that very beginning. And so, no, for me, it's so individualistic and then so much more profound to be able to share with the others in my life, the other, my parents and my family and my friends, and even their people in their spheres who then listen to the show as well. And to be able to discuss and have debates about this good earth, this good work, this good stuff is truly, truly incredible. And so, no, I've I have so much, like my ignorance is immense and I practically, I have no, I would say truly no knowledge of anything. And so it's constantly working towards expanding that supposed horizon and, you know, seeing that large ignorance and is just something that I can then come to further actualize myself as a being and no, truly. So being a part of this podcast and truly for you, Randy and Hope and to Taylor and everyone else. I've been so immensely grateful and privileged for the opportunity. It's been so much fun. It's been so informative. And I'm so, so looking forward to all that I will continue to come to know and discuss with you all. So no, I'm immensely grateful. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And, and we're we're lucky to have you be part of our humble team. And I, I remember, you know, although you were not with us um, uh, when we first began on a year ago, uh, I I believe I was emailing you saying, come on. <laughs> um, yes, yes, you were. <laughs> and I, and I, I kept at it. And um, I know they were taking a class at the time, if I recall. But in any case, you, you, were, you were in our thoughts if you, weren't, if you weren't actually there with us. And mm -hmm. Randy, go ahead. Yeah, Michael, you're with us now. <laughs> so you yes corrupted you, completely <laughs> yes yes one of one of us one of us <laughs> so uh you know me talking about the impact the show's had on my life um you know I, i've thought about it all day trying to think of a the appropriate way to frame that and 
Um, what it really comes down to is that I've, I've been able to flesh out my definition of peace through law. Mm. I've deepened my understanding of that phrase. Um, because each one of the words in the phrase is tremendously complicated and you could get lost trying to define peace. You could get lost trying to define law and you can get lost trying to define through. So peace through law is just a big mess. And this show has been part of how I've started to unpack that. And I'll go into that very briefly um, now. So, you know, before we started the show, my understanding of peace was limited to words, but it wasn't instantiated into the world and in meaningful ways that were actually helping people. It was all just flowery language and then some beautiful buildings, right? It wasn't, it wasn't all the way anchored down in the world. And when we were doing shows um, about the Grubb family, for example, uh, and, and the League of Families, there was this, there were these, the, these epiphanies where it was like, oh, the laws that are built on peaceful ideals are making seriously difficult things in people's lives better. And yeah, it's not a profound thing, but the, I didn't really have it click until I, those conversations that we were having on this show. And, and then, you know, and then it, and then it's like, once that layer, like once I, my understanding broke through that layer, it went in inside again. And like, I was like, okay, uh, these, this inner peace situation is something that also has to get developed. And, um, and I remember I, I came in into contact with a paragraph from the book I was talking about earlier from Annie Besant, um, the ancient wisdom. And, and, and it was like the word law came out and I really hung on to this idea. I'll, I'll read it. It's only two sentences um, from Annie Besant. Uh, Man can become the master of his destiny only because that destiny lies in a realm of law where knowledge can build up the science of the soul and place in the hands of man the power of controlling his future, of, of choosing alike his future character and his future circumstances. The knowledge of karma that threatened to paralyze then becomes an inspiring, supporting, and uplifting force. And so this, this idea about peace which we started off a year ago with Jane Adams' definition of peace being this uh, unfolding unfoldment of worldwide processes that nourish human life or nurture human life. One of the two, nourish, nurture. Uh, it's like this, this, this process that's supporting and uplifting everybody. And it's built on laws and those laws are built on other laws and those those laws are built on forces that we've been able to canonize into laws in the physical sciences among other things and it's this enormous you know thinking about civilization it's this enormous thing that the concentration on peace seems to uplift and you know the rising tide you know, lifts all boats, right? So as, as society starts to embody more and more peaceful ideals, more and more people's lives start to improve. And I'll just end by, you know, a, a shout out to Steven Pinker, whose book, uh, The Case for Reason, Science, uh, Humanism and Human Progress, uh, it's called uh, Enlightenment Now. Mm -hmm. That book, just it makes such a ridiculously compelling case that the world is getting better and not just a little bit it's like we are doing some serious good in the world and it's because we've built a more peaceful society a more peaceful civilization and that's occurred through laws and of course technological changes and blah 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 but like there's definitely laws that are at the bottom of that and they're not 
just written laws. Some of them are spiritual laws and they're moral laws. And we as a civilization are making enormous strides forward. And this show has made it uh, considerably easier for me to see that. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to get to spend so much time with both Hope and Michael and all of our guests and Taylor, wherever she went. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I love all of you and I'm very happy to be involved. Likewise. And again, we're honored to have you participate in this. Um, thank you, uh, both of you, for helping to bring to consciousness uh, these ideas. Um, I, I've been tremendously helped by our conversations and by the by the consistency of these discussions. Um, and I will end now by reading the seventh rule of harmony um, articulated by Cora de Brazza for the peace flag, which was back in the day flown on peace day. She has seven rules of harmony. You can of course, I know, Google this or visit coradebrutza.com or virtues of peace. Think we must, <laughs> I'm sure you will be led. If you, if you really wanna find the seven rules of harmony, you can find them on the internet. And the seventh rule says, seek each day to utter some work or perform some little action, which may promote the cause of peace whether at home or abroad. So each day do something. And so you have been listening to Virtues of Peace. Happy Peace Day. And we will be back again, I believe, unpacking further the elements of the nonviolent lifestyle. Mm -hmm.